we're, we're in this series this summer of looking at Harbor Church values and kind of revisiting our, our vision and our mission here at Harbor Church and looking at what's important to us here. Um, so John last week kind of kicked off a series within the series. We have a little two-week mini-series of looking at how, how we're called to reach out to the world around us as part of Harbor Church. Um, so if you have a Bible with you or can reach one, um, we have a couple floating around out there. Uh, turn with me to Psalm 96, and we'll look at Psalm 96 this morning. It says, Sing to the Lord a new song. <clears throat> Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, and bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The earth is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth, and he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for these words from Psalm 96, and we ask that you teach us from them. Teach us more about who you are and who we are as your people, and let us leave this place transformed. And we pray. Amen. So this is one of my favorite psalms about worship. I'm kind of a worship nerd. One of my, my college majors was music and worship, and it's all kind of right here in this psalm, so I'm a big fan. But more than just being a psalm about worship or calling us to worship, this psalm gives us lots of reasons why we worship God. It talks about all of that God has done and all that God is doing and all that God will do we trust in the future. And it talks about God being holy and splendorous and mighty and glory. It gives us all these reasons why we worship. And it says that we proclaim all of God's deeds when we come together. So if you think through kind of a typical worship service here at Harbor Church, we usually start with some songs like we just did. And if you look at the songs there, they're giving thanks for what God has done and they're telling the story of Jesus coming and living among us and dying on the cross and being raised again. They, they sort of tell the gospel story, especially if you look at them together. When we sing together, we're singing the story of what God has done in our lives. And then we have this prayer and sharing time where we share what God's doing in our own personal lives and in our lives together as Harbor Church. And we continue to keep telling these stories over and over. Everything we do in worship proclaims God's glory and his salvation and his faithfulness. When we worship, we tell these stories and we proclaim everything that God has done before and is doing now and will do someday. But there's one more really important element of worship that Psalm 96 touches on this morning, and that's that worship sends us out. We don't just come here to worship. We don't just come and you know, sit for an hour and then go out to some kind of worshipless existence. Worship sends us out so that we can continue to tell those stories and can, can continue to pray or to proclaim all the things that God has done and is doing in our lives. Usually, you may have noticed the last song that we sing on a Sunday morning is kind of a dedication song, a song that we were giving ourselves to God. Usually, we'll sing, Be Thou My Vision, maybe at the end of the service. You, you ruined one of my pictures here, but, <laughs> but, but usually we'll sing songs like, Take My Life and Let It Be, or Be Thou My Vision, or Let Us Go, songs that send us out with God as our focus and sends us into the world so we can, can proclaim what God is doing in our lives. And there's a, there's a really good reason for that. That's what worship does. 
That's what worship does for the rest of our week. It sends us into our week ready to proclaim what God has done. Libby and I, the other day, were at a meeting um, of a bunch of pastors and nonprofit leaders in, in our neighborhood here in Crown Hill and in Ballard and Greenwood. Um, Susie's been with me at a couple of these meetings before, too. This one was held at the Salvation Army building just down the street at, on Greenwood Avenue. Um, and I noticed as we were leaving, they have some Sunday worship services there. And at the, at the end of their parking lot, as you're leaving their building, they have a sign that says, your next worship service starts now. And I thought, what a great sign. Every time you leave their building, you're reminded that your next worship service starts right now. You don't just leave and worship is done, but worship sends us out into the rest of our week. So we keep telling these stories and keep telling what God has done. So last week, John talked about doing, doing ministry and reaching out to our unavoidable worlds. Reaching out to our families and to our friends and the people we work with. All of those relationships and places that we can't avoid going to throughout our weeks. So first of all, before I go any further, let me say for the record, I'm not here to negate what John said. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. We are sent to proclaim what God is doing and tell our story and share the gospel in our unavoidable worlds. And we're called to go somewhere else, too. We're called to be maybe a little bit more intentional than that, and to willingly take a step into the places we can avoid, into our avoidable worlds, and to share, share our stories and tell of God's works in those places as well. It's all here in Psalm 96. It says right in the beginning, in Psalm 96, declare God's deeds to the nations. So in the Old Testament, when it talks about the nations, it's talking to the nation of Israel and all these other nations were places they could easily avoid. And often places they kind of wanted to avoid. These were sometimes their enemies, sometimes people they fought in battle, people with different cultures and different gods and different ways of doing <coughs> things. And they, they never had to interact with these people if they didn't want to. They were completely in their avoidable world. But God calls Israel to go to the nations and to tell what God is doing and what God has done in the past. And God calls us to go to our nations, so to speak, and do the same thing. And so what are we called to proclaim? Well, it's all here in Psalm 96. It says that God has saved us. God made the heavens and the earth, and they cry out in praise to him. God is sovereign over all things, and he rules over the whole earth. And our God is the one true God. All other gods are idols. And what's more, we know what the psalmist hadn't known yet, that Jesus Christ came as the Son of God to live among us and die for us and be raised again in power so that we might be saved and live with him. That's what we proclaim in these nations, in these avoidable places. That's why we worship God. That's why we rejoice and we're jubilant and we sing songs. And that's the story that we have to tell to both our unavoidable and our avoidable worlds. There's this vision that runs through the whole Bible that someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's throughout the whole Bible. If you go to just about every single book, I think you'll find some glimpse of that vision in there. God's vision for our world is that every single individual human being will know who God is and why we worship him. And so we as Christians should share that vision with God. We should live in a way that we proclaim that God is God and that Jesus Christ is Lord. What's more, God wants to partner with us in that vision. He wants to work alongside us. He wants to use us in his ministry to make that vision a reality. What a blessing that is for us, that God wants to partner with us in his mission. And so all of that means that, yes, we do ministry where we already are and where we can't avoid, but we also need to be a little bit more intentional than that. To do ministry in ways that force us to take that step willingly into the places we can avoid and share God's story there. There's this fascinating moment in Jesus' ministry 
um, in the book of Mark. Kind of right in Jesus' ministry, right in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is from Mark 1, verse 35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place to pray. Simon Peter and his companions went to go look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. So Jesus replied, let's go somewhere else. Let's go to the nearby villages so I can preach there, too. That's why I've come. And so he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So here was Jesus in his unavoidable world. He was in his hometown in Galilee among his friends and his family, and he'd already called a couple of the disciples, not quite all 12 yet, but a few of them. He was, he was right there in his unavoidable world. He was doing ministry already. Already he had healed some people and been baptized and driven out demons. And apparently things were going well because when he went off by himself, people were looking for him. But when they find him, he says, let's go somewhere else. He could have stayed right there in his unavoidable world. He could have been the Messiah and the Son of God right there among his friends and his family. But he knew that the world was so much bigger than that. He knew that God's vision and God's call for Jesus was so much bigger than just the people that he couldn't avoid seeing every day. And so he intentionally went somewhere else and traveled around to the different towns and different villages and did ministry there, too. What a powerful model for us. That Jesus himself, Jesus who's the message and the messenger, went intentionally outside of his unavoidable world, into the places he didn't have to go if he didn't want to, to do ministry. Because he knew that's why he was called. And that's what we're called to do, too. We're called to spread the gospel to all people, in all places, even if we can avoid them, if we want to. Last week, when John was talking about the unavoidable world, he talked about another great example from Jesus, this call just to come and see. Jesus often would call people and just say, come and see what's going on. Come and see what I'm about to do. And so John challenged us last week, but that's a great invitation that we can now extend to the people around us. And really, when we're reaching out to this avoidable world, these, these nations, so to speak, the invitation is still the same. We can still go there and invite others to come and see what God is doing in our lives, or around the world, or here at Harbor Church. The invitation is still the same. We just have to be a little more intentional about going out and making the invitation. And the beauty of it all and the reality is, no matter where we go, we're always in God's world. No matter where we go, there's not a single place we can head to where God hasn't been there first. And God is already at work. And God is waiting and inviting us to join him in what he's doing there. We can't, even if it's, if our, if it, sorry, even if it's in our avoidable world, it's not in God's avoidable world. He's already there. Plus, when we reach out to our avoidable world, we begin to change. God expands our vision of what he's doing and our vision of the world, and it changes us. I know in my own life, um, many of you know that my husband is Jeremy, and Jeremy's from Malaysia. And before I met Jeremy, Malaysia was completely my avoidable world. I had never, I'd never met anyone from Malaysia. I'd never been to Malaysia. I never in the world thought that I would ever have a reason to go to Malaysia. And with apologies to all the Malaysians watching the video, it probably wasn't even on my top <laughs> 10 places for vacation. <laughs> it, was, it was totally my avoidable world. But suddenly I met Jeremy and we were getting married. And God changed that piece of my avoidable world into my unavoidable world. And I had family there. And I have friends there now, and it's completely changed how I see the world. All of a sudden, I was exposed to new foods and new accents and new ways of talking, so much so that sometimes my mom tells me I say my dog's name with a Malaysian accent, but <laughs> I began to change and my world was expanded. 
And I began to see how God is at work in Malaysia and in other places around the world. And that changed how I see how God is at work in my own life and in here in Seattle and in the United States. When I was kind of thrust into this avoidable part of my life, it became my unavoidable world and it completely shifted my perspective. And that's what God does with us. When we take that step into our avoidable worlds, he makes it our unavoidable world because he makes us love it and he makes us learn from it. And he teaches us more about who God is and who we are in God and what he's up to all over the place. And what's more, what does it say if we refuse to go to these places? What does it say if we don't go to our avoidable world? I think if we don't take that step and don't take that risk to go into the places we can avoid, I think we run the risk of saying that those people who we can avoid don't deserve the hope and the joy that we have in knowing Jesus Christ. If our hope is that every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, who are we to deprive others of that joy and that knowledge? If God is waiting and inviting us to partner with him in his ministry, who are we to say no to that invitation? God invites us to come and see too. So who are we to say no? We have to extend that invitation to others, both in our unavoidable and our avoidable worlds. We have to find ways to be intentional, to willfully take that step, and to reach out to those that we might be able to avoid if we wanted to. So the question, for all of us this morning is what are these nations? What is this avoidable world for each of us? I think often when we, when we think about messages like this or hear messages like this, we're talking about international missions, right? Going overseas to different lands and different countries and continents to go and do God's ministry. And that is a beautiful and a noble thing to do. We just heard a couple weeks ago from our friends Mike and Katie Lucero, who right now as we speak, I think are somewhere in the air to going to Indonesia to do just that. And who knows, maybe some of you feel that call too. But I think often our avoidable worlds are much closer than we like to think they are. We meet here in Crown Hill at Harvard Church and some of us live in this neighborhood and could walk here or bike here or just drive a couple minutes if we wanted to, but some of us come from Edmonds or from Renton or from Woodenville or other places around Seattle or around the Sound. And this neighborhood can easily be our avoidable world. It would be so easy for us just to drive in to Crown Hill for an hour on Sundays and drive out and never pay a single thought to the people who live on this block or in our zip code or in the Crown Hill area. This would be so easy to be our unavoidable world, but how are we being faithful Christians here in this place if we never extend that invitation to our neighbors right here in Crown Hill? How are we following God's call as Harvard Church if we avoid the people who are right here around us? Others of us are, can very easily avoid places that have been hit by poverty or by economic difficulty. Most of us don't ever have to go to a food bank or to a homeless shelter. These are all places we can easily avoid in our daily lives. But how are we following God's call if we don't go to those places and share that Jesus Christ is Lord? And share our stories of what God is doing in our lives in those places as well. For some of us, maybe it's even simpler than that. Maybe it's just we can avoid people who are of different ages than us or different skin colors, or different nationalities. But who are we to decide that those people who aren't like us don't deserve to hear the joy and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ? Maybe it's just as simple as going down the hall to the room where our kids are right now and volunteering there for a Sunday. Maybe that's our avoidable world, just down the hall from us right now. Sometimes it's so much closer than we like to think it is. 
this avoidable world. But when we don't go to these nations, to these avoidable places, we run the risk of saying they don't deserve to hear the story of Jesus Christ. They don't deserve to have the kind of hope and joy that we have. And we run the risk of missing out on what God has for us when we reach out as well. I think if we truly believe that God is great and worthy to be praised, if we truly believe that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, we should be excited to go and share that story with the whole world, not just the people right around us in our own circles, but with everybody. Out of sheer gratitude and appreciation for what God has done for us, we should be excited to continue to proclaim what God is doing in our lives, even as we leave this place. In Matthew 5, Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16, it says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We're called to be this light to the whole world. Not just our little circles, but the whole world. To let it shine like a table sitting on a lamp, sitting on a stand. Each one of us is called to this ministry in our avoidable worlds. We're called to share the good news of Jesus Christ in all the corners of God's creation so that every single person, every piece of God's creation can join us in this worship. And the blessing of it all and the beauty of it all is that God is already there. No matter where we go, God is already there and he's inviting us to join him and be his partner in ministry here. As we end this morning, I found a poem. Someone posted it on Facebook, so I have no idea who wrote this poem, but I thought it was a really beautiful and simple prayer to end this time. So, will you join me in prayer? Master, you call me, and I gladly obey. Only direct me, and I'll find your way. Teach me the mission appointed for me. What is my labor, and where shall it be? Master, you called me, and this I reply, ready and willing, Lord. Here am I. Lord, I will follow if you will but lead. Only support me with grace in my need. Pardon whenever I turn from the right. Help me and bring me again to the light. Master, you call me, and this I reply, ready and willing, Lord. Here am I. I'm so grateful for you being here, and uh, there's no one that I'd rather have take one of my sermons and take it a whole nother direction and, <laughs> and have depth and meaning than you. <laughs> so great.